Welcome back, everyone, to the Stoey Geek Show. Sorry, I was entranced by the cigar I'm about to light up. This is a, a Fuente Hemingway with the Rosado wrapper on it. We've talked about these on the show. A, yeah. uh, this is like a white whale for a lot of people. I have very few of these in my humidor. I'm glad we're documenting it for posterity. I don't want these to age out uh, anymore. You can see, I don't know if you can see on the camera, there's a little bit of plume that's building up on it, so I want to uh, take this down today. I thought our three-year anniversary show would be a good opportunity uh, to do that. Yeah, so. no, I, I have no complaints about what you just gave me. Yeah, and well, I wanted to make sure you smoked one of those. We talked about it on our first segment today. Yeah, the, the Davidoff uh, Royal Salamonis. Um, this, I think Paul has been, he talked about earlier, the potential cigar of the year candidate right now. In Absolutely. His, in his book, this is a very generous gift. Thank you very much for this. I You're cannot welcome. wait to light this up. Um, just a little housekeeping before we go, um, before we get, uh, get into our next segment with Nick Malolo of Malolo International. Um, we're going to have Seth Geese on from Seth's Humidor um, in the next segment. And I got word from Seth this morning that for our three-year anniversary in support of cigar rights, he's donated a very, very um, generous sampler out of his personal humidor. I'm going to read these cigars real quick. There's some good stuff in there. You'll want to stay tuned. There's a Romacraft Intemperance AWS. There's an E.P. Carrillo Inaugural 2009. Mm. There's an E.P. Carrillo Limitada 2010. Oh. The two new Syndicato oh. cigars, the Maduro and the Natural, which are fantastic smokes that are um, being made by Casa Fernandez. It is a uh, Tatawahe Black Label Petit Lancero, a Tatawahe Mummy, a Viaje Super Lance, and the Viaje Limited from Atlantic Cigar. So mm. we thank Seth for that as well okay. and um, just want to also give a quick shout out to Chris and Frank um, who have been working behind the scenes today feverishly to keep this show going so they've been doing an outstanding job basically they let us just sit here and look pretty as much as we fail at that exactly you know exactly um, and you know we had we've had Mark Jr. in here and Stogie Sand is coming back a little later so I mean we've really had and we have uh, Pete Cottrell Big Pete, Big Pete as well who's house. really been hanging here with the whole show um, so thank you so much Without further ado, um, on the line um, is a friend of the show, um, Nicholas Malillo, now of Malillo International. Nicholas, Will Cooper, and Paul Asadorian in Rhode Island, how are you doing today? Guys, congratulations on the anniversary. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. All right, the first question is, where are you right now? I am, uh, I am in Connecticut in my cigar barn here. This is uh, a post and beam barn I built. Uh, I use it as an office and... Uh, to smoke cigars. It, lo it looks a little chilly, but you're looking very stylish, Nick. I it's, like it. It's chilly. You know, I thought I'd wear my smoking jacket for the first time. Very stylish. I, I've never worn this, so I thought it was appropriate for the show. Absolutely. What are you smoking, Nick? I am smoking uh, a cigar I rolled up about 60, 60 days ago. It's got uh, Habano Ecuador wrapper. It's mm -hmm. got a uh, Brazilian Habano binder, and it has some filler from Esteli and Jalapa. Now, is uh, this a cigar you're planning to come out with, or? Um, eventually, yeah, I hope. I'm in the blending process. I've been in the blending process for some time, so I hope to have a cigar um, on the market sometime in 2015. Um, not really rushing. I'm taking my time, and uh, yeah, so I started the process. I, I roll up my own, own blends and uh, starting it from here. Now, Nick, speaking of weather conditions which is normally a boring subject but as we move into some colder weather and let's yeah. you're in the blending process i find and i don't know if you guys find this too that smoking them in a warm climate or a humid climate or a dry climate or a cold climate changes the flavor profile for me sometimes pretty drastically i mean do you uh, factor that into kind of your blending process is the environment you're smoking in definitely definitely you have to be really careful you know i spend some time out in colorado i mean sometimes the moisture content out there is you know 10 percent, 12 percent. if you leave a cigar out for 10 minutes it goes bone dry yeah so so you definitely have to and there's certain wrapper leaves you work with Habano Ecuador, Sumatra wrappers, sometimes Connecticut shade. Sometimes those wrapper leaves are so thin and so subtle that, you know, they can Excuse crack when you light them. Mm -hmm. Because once you light the cigar, expansion happens. Yes. So if you're in a drier climate and that wrapper uh, doesn't have enough moisture, once you light that, it's going to start to expand and then crack that outside wrapper. So definitely take that into account 
when you're mm -hmm. when you're blending a cigar. So you have to be careful. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So, so uh, what kind of like flavor profile and smoking experience are you going for with the the, the one you just rolled? You know, I'm going for definitely a, a medium to to medium to full, but I'm I've really been captivated by just the the Cuban flavor profile mm -hmm. recently. Um, I haven't smoked a lot of Cubans over the past decade, just being in Nicaragua all the time. So I'm really, you know, to me, Cubans have the, the quality. I'll have one box, one cigar will smoke phenomenal, and then the next one is not burning right. It's not drawing right. So I'm trying to capture the, the, that good experience of, uh, you know, medium to full cedary uh, spice, but you know, not jading the palate, not overwhelming the palate. I want to keep it nice and nice and round and balanced and complex. Mm -hmm. You know, is, is at it, the same time. How difficult is it to kind of emulate that Cuban flavor profile? It seems to me like it's so unique. It is, yeah, it's very unique, man. I mean, it's it's so unique because you can't change climate from mm -hmm. different countries. You know, every every tobacco is, is so unique because a lot of it is the climate, which you can't reproduce. It's like the Connecticut River Valley. You take broadleaf and you grow it anywhere else, it's not going to be the same because you don't have the Connecticut River. It's like 410 miles long and has a tremendous effect in the valley. So it definitely... You know, it's difficult in that way, but Nicaragua is is very interesting because it's a lot of Cuban seed, but the Nicaraguan climate makes for much, for to me, much more powerful, uh, flavorful leaf. So mm -hmm. That's interesting. You know, I think you, you can't, you're never going to make it unless you're working with Cuban tobacco in that way, but you, to me, you can make a better smoke um, just because Nicaraguan provides a lot of flavor which you can't necessarily get from the Cubans. Nick, do you do you put certain That's leaves debatable. Yeah, do you put certain leaves in your cigars so that they burn better or is that more a function of how they're rolled? Um, do they burn better? Yeah, as long as you have com you know leaves that combustion properly, together they should burn together. Um, so it's a con you know it's a combina you know you're not going to put in a leaf that there's definitely different combinations to help things burn yeah. when you're using binder wrapper combinations you know early on i was always told there was a lot of people that wouldn't put a dark wrapper with a dark binder they said you never do that but to me that's ca case uh, case by case you know for example with liga privada that's a broadly thick wrapper and the binder is modafina madura zil mm -hmm. so both of them I knew were excellent combusting tobacco. So there shouldn't be any reason why they wouldn't work together, if right. that makes sense. Right, right. You know? But yeah. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> sort of. It's okay. Um, <laughs> so I, lately, I, you know, I've, I've noticed some voids in some of my cigars. And, and is that just a sheer function of rolling, correct? Is that the dark void? It's the dark <laughs> void. Yeah, like you could take your draw poker, right, and poke a hole through the end of the, you know, the lit end of your cigar, uh -huh. uh, and there are varying, you know, lengths. And sometimes you can smoke through them. Sometimes you can't. Like, what do you recommend people do when they run into that situation? Wait, say this again. It's a, it's a hole in the cigar. Yeah, like if you look at the lit end, right, uh, -huh. uh like after you ash it, you can actually see a hole. And if you take a draw poker or something like that, you can poke it in it's the like hole. It's like a crevice almost. It's like yeah. burnt through. Right. I, that, could be, that could be a couple of different things. Um, you know, that could be just improper construction mm -hmm. of the filler leaves. Or sometimes what happens is you can have all, all leaves when they're going to the production floor have to go through. Uh, they have to lower the humidity in the leaves. Okay. Because the leaves can't be too humid on the production floor. That could cause a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So the leaves have to be dehumi dehumidified. So if sometimes some of those leaves are too dry, that can burn right through the center of the cigar. So it, basically oh, that I leaf see. is combusting. Or it could yeah. be over-fermented tobacco also. You know, if the tobacco is too over-fermented, it's got a higher combustion, it's, it's oh. burning at a much faster rate. I never thought of it. That, I always thought of it like the roller, like it was rolled on a Friday kind of thing. 
I never thought of it as a, a I wouldn't rule player. that out either. It yeah. could be, you know, it, it depends. Right. I did the other option you presented is uh, makes a lot of sense and that's very very interesting. Yeah, do you feel it soft? Like is there when you smoke in and you see those holes, is there do the cigars feel underfilled to you? Yeah, sometimes you can tell okay. they're kind of underfilled, but other times yeah. it feels like a well-constructed cigar, but you still get the void and I think that's speaking to just another leaf in there burning more quickly. Yeah, definitely. If they're soft too, you know that's just going to make it burn much hotter. Yeah, and it, depending on the positioning of the leaves, also. I mean, if you don't have the ligero or the viso positioned properly in the bunch, mm -hmm. and you have some of the lower primings, thinner tobaccos also in the center, mm -hmm. then that will cause it, you know, also to burn faster. That's interesting. I didn't know that. That's why I love yeah. having you on the show, Nick. Yes. I learned so much from you. It's great. Yeah. I'm, uh, Will, did glad. you have more, more questions for, for Nick? Yeah, so I got a couple. So I'll start with one. So, Nicholas, um, one thing is um, th it's been no secret there's been an increase in uh, Maduro's from, from uh, using San Andreas wrapper to here. Mm -hmm. Is, there, is yeah. there any business drivers for that? Is it due to supply and demand? Is oh, it just definitely. a trendy yeah. thing? What's going on with that? So, I mean, in general, modif you're talking Mexican San Andreas, I'm sorry, is, is always been a, a really popular tobacco throughout throughout the years it's gaining more popularity for a number of factors um one is the situation growing situations in mexico have become a lot more favorable there's more farmers that are growing san andreas tobaccos mexican tobaccos that's that's contributed to the increase also you have um a change in the modafina brazil tobacco so I used to purchase a lot of tobacco from, from Brazil, Matafina, say 2003, 2004, 2005. What happened is, is the, weather's, the weather hasn't been too favorable. The exchange rate between um, hmm. Brazil and the United States hasn't been favorable, but more so it's been the yields of the Matafina crops. They haven't been yielding enough wrapper tobaccos to justify growing it, okay? Because you have to, you know, you have to come out with enough um, wrapper tobaccos. Otherwise, the fillers are going to end up being, you know, very expensive and priced out of the market. Which, in general, Matafina filler has gone up tremendously also throughout the past 10 years. So a lot of people have stopped growing it in Matafina. So a lot of this has shifted towards Mexico. Um, so Mexico tobacco, it's... It's very excellent in flavor uh, profile. It's a um, beautiful Maduro wrapper. You can get incredible Maduros from it. And um, it doesn't require a tremendous amount of fermentation, and the combustion is, is, is excellent. So that's sort of contributed to a lot of it. Interesting. So, you know, as far as broadleaf goes, um, I had heard a couple of years ago that, you know, the, there was some storms that hit the Connecticut River Valley and that there was some there was some damage to crops. I think some of the general farms that were there reported it. Are we seeing anything right now where there could be a shortage of Connecticut broadleaf or have they been able to weather the storm with that, so to speak? Yeah, I don't think there's going to be a uh, shortage necessarily. Um, this past growing season, there was... Um, I think it was the rainiest June um, in Connecticut for like the past 50 years. So they had record rainfall and there was a tornado and some hailstorms. Actually, it was more hailstorms that, that moved through. Um, but it was concentrated area. So uh, I don't think it affected it enough where you'd have a shortage. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of broadleaf on the market. I think this crop year turned out to be a really good crop year besides June and some of the farms that got hit in general. Um, it wasn't – the rest of July and August weren't extremely rainy. It wasn't extremely hot in August this year, mm -hmm. which doesn't make for thicker tobacco. But uh, in general, I think the crop's going to be a, a good crop this year. So what I've seen so far is, is looking beautiful. Excellent. So, yeah, there was a few farmers that were hit, and uh, I heard a barn was set on fire uh, about a week ago, but I heard there was no tobacco in it, and they still don't know um, how it got set. I think it was possibly some kids or something. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yeah, but in general, the crop looks good. 
So in terms of the broadleaf crop net, because I know you're very close to that, that region, um, what are the different primings typically used for uh, that come off of those broadleaf uh, plants grown in Connecticut? So, you know, broadleaf became very popular through the, the 18, late 1800s, 1900s because of its size mm -hmm. of the leaves. They're some of the largest leaves, I think, tobacco leaves on the planet. So that became favorable amongst a lot of the machine-made operations that were happening because when you have such a big leaf, the smaller cigars, you can actually cut through the vein, mm -hmm. okay? And that you know, depending on the cigar, it has to be a smaller cigar, you can get a tremendous yield from one plant. Whereas in the premium cigar industry, you know, the veins cause, cause a lot more of an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the valley, a lot of that broadleaf is still used for machine-made uh, cigars, particularly backwoods. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get a lot of good yields from those plants that way. For, for premium cigars, the vein structure causes somewhat of a problem, but when you get a thinner leaf, you get, of course, thinner uh, vein structure. So you can use, you know, as long as it's good, clean-looking leaf, you can use all of the primings as wrapper tobacco. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. So a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of cigars in the market, there's always a decent amount of broadleaf. In my case, in when we were making... Ligo, we use just the top part of the plant, so we okay. made things a little hard for ourselves. Um, but is that typically the best priming, right? I mean, well, that's getting yeah, the most nutrients, right? It's got the most nutrients. It's you know the leaves, the the whole plant is growing, so the concentration of the energy is towards the top of the plant. There's thicker leaves, there's mm -hmm. smaller smaller leaves. So generally speaking, yes, it is more more powerful uh, in strength and in flavor, but. You know, I don't want to disregard the rest of the plant because yeah. the, the rest of those leaves are still wrapper very leaves. flavorful and wrapper, wrapper grade leaves. Um, so it can be used for, you know, many, many cigars. On the binder, too, right? Some people will use broadleaf on the binder. They're less common, though, right? Binder, you know, I think a lot of people use broadleaf binder, but sometimes a lot of people don't really advertise it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's tough sometimes because of the vein structure also, because if you have a thick veiny binder, sometimes depending on the, you know, what type of cigar it is, um, you know, the veins could pop through the wrapper. You see, you know what yeah, I'm saying? And yeah, then that yeah. just makes it less attractive. But um, yeah, using broadleaf as binder, I mean, you have to. I mean, if you're buying from the ba valley, you're buying crops. That's how you're purchasing it. You got to find a home for everything. So, mm -hmm. and it's a tasty, tasty binder. I mean, blended properly, it adds that natural sweetness to the blend um, that you can't really find in any other tobacco. Yeah, you know, he was in EP Carrillo on a short run, 2012. He used it in the binder. Oh, really? In the binder, yep. Oh, nice. Yep. And yeah, people use it as filler, to, you know, filler also. Yeah. I mean, and it's it's great to use as filler. You don't have to be concerned as much as the, you know, the vein structure and whatnot. So um, also it, it adds really nicely to, as a filler tobacco. And I think that's become more and more popular throughout the years. Um, so, of Nick, course, we're doing this, this show in support of CRA, right, in our cigar rights. Right. Um, with the Connecticut Valley being in the U.S. and the FDA, obviously, in the U.S. being very proactive in, in coming after, have... Uh, have you guys kind of like banded together in that region to say, hey, when you come down with cigar regulations, you're affecting jobs in in our own home country, right? I mean, a lot of cigars are manufactured, you know, in Nicaragua, Dominican, Honduras. Um, but here's the situation where the, the farms are in the U.S. So are, do you have kind of like a different angle you're taking with those cigar rights? I talked with Glenn. We've, we've talked throughout the years, and I've gotten Glenn in contact and the CRA contact with farmers in the valley, mm -hmm. and they've actually talked and been down to Capitol Hill and have been involved in this because that is definitely um, you know, something that would greatly affect you, the United States, the jobs. The last thing we, we need is for people to lose jobs in this country. Exactly. So, um, it hits know, home in that, in that region for sure. Yeah, and the history, I mean, the history of, the, of it, it should really be, you know, protected in that way, 
I yeah, think. Yeah. Be because the history of this leaf, we protect buildings that are historical. We mm -hmm. protect this. This is this is a sacred custom that we've been, you know, it's been done way before this country was even founded. Mm -hmm. So, you know, oh, that's interesting. It should be it should be protected because the history you drive into the valley, you guys should definitely take a trip with me sometime. We definitely should. Um, yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we should do a special that. special trip and um I mean, it's just gorgeous. It's 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 amazing. The barns, the tobacco barns, are still you know up from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and you have the uh, tobacco museum in Connecticut also, which I suggest we should we should actually hit that up when you guys come come up. Um, you know, it's just it's gorgeous. It's just living history. Mm. You know, oh, that's really cool. in the valley, so it needs to be protected because a lot of livelihoods if tobacco went went down. Mm -hmm. so. Will, do you have more questions? Yeah, just as well as we're on the topic of the farms, I had a, what is, what is exactly the growing season? Um, when does it run from when to when in, in the Connecticut area? So th the seed beds usually start in, in April. Um, that's usually when, when all the seed beds are being prepared and then tobacco starting to get into the ground in May. And then that will run until September. So then you have, you have tobacco in the curing barns throughout September and sometimes the beginning of of October. Um, so it's a, you know it's it's a five six month window, and you're at the of Mother Nature, you know. Oh, exactly, exactly. But, as you mentioned. Yeah. So Nick, other than your own blends, what have you been smoking lately? What have I been smoking? I smoked a Fuente Shark yesterday. Yeah, which that one? That somebody gave me. I don't know. It was a beautiful looking. Uh, like almost box torpedo. It was it had to have been about six inches, six. Yeah, six, was it a, six and was a half. it an Opus or Añejo or? No, it was the uh, An Añejo. Yes. Yeah. I have some. I have some of those with me to uh, potentially smoke today. Really, well. I want to say that that must have been a broadleaf wrapper. Yeah, I was going to say it yeah. is in fact Holy a broadleaf cow. wrapper. Yeah, I've got a whole a whole bag of them. This bag is dated uh, December 2012. Oh, so wow. really? A good friend of mine. Uh, gave me that stick and it's been married and uh, yesterday I just felt inspired to light it up and it was it didn't disappoint it's my favorite Añejo is to it be honest with you it is I don't for whatever reason I gravitate towards that size yeah I hadn't smoked a Fuente in a long time but that was are they so are those still out right now um, usually like they come out ar around this time of year. Yeah. Usually uh, okay, later, yeah. Yeah, later in December, you might see uh, boxes of those come to the retailers. I know they've been pretty consistent in the past two or three years. Um, yeah. the, the availability has been pretty good. Before that, the availability was not good, and I, had, I, I could not find them. And then uh, I'd say some of the oldest ones in my humidor that I purchased here, yeah. uh, probably about three, three years old. I woke up in the morning. I I lit up this Nat Sherman, which was pretty tasty. Nice. They're doing yeah. some great stuff. They are. Uh, uh, Sherman. yeah. Michael's doing a phenomenal job. I uh, and the whole Sherman family. I mean, I've been I've been really loving. I've been going to Nat Sherman since since the '90s. Used to go down there with my dad a lot. And um, yeah, the time. I mean, the timeless. Uh, I smoked a couple of those timeless. Some of the smaller Vitolas, man. They're, they're really tasty. Yeah, that Joel Sherman we were talking about today. Yeah. Uh, Joel Sherman's in the running for one of our most favorite cigars of the year. Is yep. that the Connecticut wrap? Yeah. Yep. In the beauty in the piano box? Yep. Uh, the, yes. uh, with his sim yeah. It, yeah, that's... It came out of left of field for us. We didn't see that one coming as good of a cigar as it turned out. To, I mean, they're doing great, great stuff, but that one, in my opinion, was at a whole other level. You enjoyed that? Nice. Yeah, I had one at the show. Um, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I love the uh, the packaging also. Yeah, cool. and like I said, the, the job that Michael's done on both production and distribution has been one. I think one of the great turnarounds. Um, you know, and it's a very iconic brand as you know, growing up in the Northeast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael's a Connecticut Connecticut boy. I forgot about that. Yes, that's right. You know, we we know we know how to ball. We know basketball. We know tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, all right, I, I, you know, we have you on. I might as well ask the question, and you could tell me as little as, or as much as you want. Obviously, right. your former company, Drew Estate, made some news in the last month. Oh, um, you were going there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
As I say, you could talk a little much. Um, give us your thoughts. In the room. Yeah, yeah. that's right. What, what do you What do you think? Um, what can we expect? Um, what What are your thoughts? Whatever you want to share or not share is fine with us. What are my thoughts? Um, I think it's. Um, you know, I think there's a lot going on in the industry. Um, I think I didn't realize Swisher was a family-run company. I mean, of course, everybody's known about Swisher. Um, I think if they 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 do what they say and let it run, um, and also they're able to you know merge some of what Swisher does operationally. You know, Drew Estate has grown so rapidly throughout the years, so you know structure definitely helps, and I'm sure those guys know structure well just in the business they've been in but the key is to keep it you know they they're saying they're going to keep it the way it is so i think if they keep it the way it is and and everybody's still involved they're going to do great things so you know i guess time will time will tell yeah we we, we kind of looked at it the same way when we were kind of recapping it on the show is you know it, it was it was a business decision and, you know, we kind of looked at there are a lot of positives with a company like Switcher, which I thought had a very, when I went through the history of that company, I was surprised they have a pretty rich history in terms of, um, even though they're not met per se in the premium cigar market, but they've been in tobacco a long time. Yeah, a long time, a long time. So, you know, it's just, there. it's a different market. You know, the mass market and the handmade market is, is very different. So for them, they, they made a really phenomenal move to purchase you know i think one of the best cigar companies handmade cigar companies in the world so um I, you know i don't think they have any interest in touching you know what the soul and what has made drew estate drew estate throughout the years so i think as as long as that happens you know everything will just keep you know, keep. They just came out with that Pappy Van Winkle, man. That's. I remember you. Sh I I actually remember you talking about that in Nicaragua. You remember that? Yep. Yeah. We, went, we, were nice. we were right over the rum bar or the the, the 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 barrels. We were over. Yeah. And, I, uh, I had talked to Julian Van Winkle some. It must be like two years now. Just before it was actually around this time of the year, and we were talking. And I ended up sending him some L40s, and it was just before, just before Thanksgiving. And he, he ended up giving them out to everybody, his family that came over. And he called me up and he said, uh, wow, those cigars were phenomenal. What, what could I do for you? And I said, man, two 20-year barrels, if you can put me on the top of the list, that would be phenomenal. And sure enough, had those two 20-year barrels shipped down to Nicaragua and uh, was working on curing some fillers. I'm not sure what they, you know, what they ended up doing for the project. I just saw it this week, but... Um, it was cool to see. So in other words, they, they took the tobaccos and they, these barrels that already, uh, were used for Pappy Van Winkle, they're cured in those barrels. They're not necessarily, so they're kind of imparting. Well, I don't know. I don't know that. All, I mean, when I was working on uh, the project, I didn't know anything about this project that they were going to do something. So I had just sent them down to Nicaragua for me to fool around with them. Now, I remember uh, when we were in the factory, you guys. Yeah. That's where, yeah. Yeah. So I, I really don't know what they did after that, um, whether they used those or, or not for the project. Um, I didn't really read the read all of the press release exactly. So I'm not sure exactly. Do you guys know? Did they say anything? About they, they didn't say. But when I saw the press release, the first thing I thought about was when we were all standing in the factory and you, you, you were talking, and, it, and, it was, and at the time it seemed like it was more of something you were, like you said, you were experimenting with this to see what would happen, but you, it was clear you didn't know what was going to happen when, when we were in the factory there. Yeah, I had a number of blends that I made up, and I, I worked with curing just the raw leaf into the barrels because a lot of, a lot of different manufacturers, it's, it's a process I never really used, which was curing filler tobaccos in barrels. I know it's been done, uh, I think it's done by La Aurora in the Dominican, and I think you know, Fuente does that. I've never been familiar with the process, so I thought it would, uh, would be great to try on some, some Pappy. So I actually first started with three Buffalo Trace barrels that I had, and I worked with those first before I touched the Pappy. 20 years and um i had some some interesting blends coming out um i think there's only a few cigars uh i think i have some of them i think there's like 10 left 
Um, so I don't know what after that, whether they used him, used him or not. I, I couldn't tell you. So cool, cool. Yeah. What do you guys think about the the Swisher acquisition? I'm I'm happy for Drew Estate, man. I think it's a, I think it's I think it's a great move for them. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like you said, Swisher has a rich history, and uh, I think they're going to do great things together. It's really kind of a a melding, as you said, as a company like Swisher, who's primarily been in the machine made, um, blending with uh, a company in the premium cigar industry that just has some awesome marketing and awesome knowledge of premium handmade cigars. So I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah the fusion can be great. Go ahead, Coop. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was going to basically, and I, I agree, you know, there's a point where a company is going to reach and if they want to grow, sometimes they have to, they have to change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think Swisher looked at Drew Estate and maybe saw some things that they can bring into their own enterprise. And yep. learn from now. I've been part. I've been in my day job. I've been in companies that I've been acquired, and I've been in, uh, part of things that have been a part of acquisitions, so to speak. So I've seen it work both ways. It's not sometimes in a uh, where they they push something down on you. Yeah, there's going to be changes that will happen, but sometimes they they get the company to try to um, learn and absorb for the whole enterprise. That and I think there's there's something to say. You you've been a, you were part of that Drew Estate. It's unique, obviously. They didn't get Drew Estate to just squash it. They got Drew Estate because they saw something there that they can use to grow it. So I think I agree with Paul. I, I think it's a very positive thing. I think we obviously we have to see how it all plays out in the, in the uh, upcoming months. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the fusion can be, you know, especially with the FDA, you know, pending regulations too, to have, you know, to also have protection or, and have someone that's going to go to bat for you is, is – uh, I guess also helps. So no, a absolutely, and you know it, it's absolutely. Look, you're not going to see in that book. You, you know, you're not going to see Liga Pravada in your gas station. It's not. That's not what's no, going to happen. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, that would. That's just ridiculousness. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So well, they. You know, it may help switch you with some other. Uh, you know, channels to market. I could see that. Um, you know, they have some premium lines that they can maybe tap into the Drew Estate sales force, which I think, I think there's some things that, I think, there, I think there's some exciting things that we can look to see, and it's certainly going to keep things interesting over, over the next year. Most definitely, yeah. It's going to be curious to see over the next year, you know, there seems to be some movement, you know, with general purchasing Taranio, and, you know, who knows what's going to happen over the next year. You might see some more acquisitions. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know it's a, it's a nature that businesses go through a lot, and, and I always say acquisitions are a healthy thing. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. they're not. Yeah, sometimes they're not always pleasant, but sometimes it's a healthy thing for the industry as a whole. Yeah, 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 definitely. And I think if you if you can learn from each other and use each other's you know resources and knowledge and information, and you use that properly, I mean it's it's a phenomenal combination. Absolutely. So. Cool. Absolutely. Well, Nick, I'm very excited about having you in here in the studio and, and taking a tour uh, in Connecticut uh, yeah, of the tobacco Yeah, I'm going to be in touch with you on that for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Be in t I mean, I guess in Connecticut it would be good when you could see tobacco in the field. Yeah, was and that June, the whole June process. you said? What's that? Yeah, June would be good. June, okay. July. We should definitely plan a uh, maybe a little uh, barbecue and a uh, Absolutely. Whole, whole little event. We should do like a little special episode. I think we could. I think we will definitely yeah. make that happen. We will definitely be in touch with that. I think that we'll would be, be cool. To... That would be fun. We gotta. You guys should do a show from the uh, my cigar barn one night. Absolutely. Oh, I want to hang out in there. <laughs> I don't yeah. want a smoking yeah. jacket too. So. <laughs> 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 Maybe we should have Stogie Geek smoking, smoking jacket. Yeah, we can yeah. talk about that. Yeah. That would be nice. This one. I mean, this one came out pretty nice. I'm. I'm impressed by this yeah. one. Yep. Cool. Well, Nick, thank you very much. Thank and, you, Nick. Uh, we'll guys, thanks soon. for having me. I have a good weekend. It. All right. Thank you, Nick. All right. Have a good one. So with that, we're going to take a short break. Come back and on tap. Uh, Seth from Seth Humidor. Seth from Seth Humidor. That's going to be an entertainment effort. segment for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Seth is always entertaining after that. Phil Zangi. So don't go anywhere. We're doing an all-day podcast in support of Cigar Rights of America. That's CigarRights.org. Right. Make sure you go join or renew your membership today. And you qualify to win a fabulous five, uh, prize pack. What is the... You join, uh, I, I brought a box of unopened San Cristobal Classicos. So Sweet. I will... I will put two entries in that, and there'll probably be another contest entry as, uh, with that as well. Excellent. So stay tuned. We'll be right back.